Welcome everyone! Today we're going to take a deep dive into speedrunning Germany in Hearts of Iron 4. Our main goal for this run is to capitulate all major nations from the start of the game as quickly as possible, measured by the in-game date. These nations are the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Japan, the United States and the Soviet Union. After defeating the majors, we've basically beaten the game, the rest is just tedious but easy cleanup. I will try my best to explain everything that's happening on the fly, and if necessary also the reasoning behind it. Anyway, enjoy. We start with a speedrun to capitulate the allies, since it's the first step towards capitulating all majors anyway. I'm playing on the current version of the game, Iron Man mode and historical with all DLCs, and no mods of course. I'm only using DLC features from Together for Victory and La Resistance. Both are optional, but especially Together for Victory is pretty useful. We queue up some basic research, nothing fancy. If you don't like paratroopers, that's fine, let me assure you that they aren't necessary for this run. I just use them to mess with the Soviets later. Although not crucial, we construct some military factories, because having lots of equipment as fast as possible is arguably the most important thing for fast conquests. That's why we also focus our production primarily on infantry equipment, remove tanks completely and add transport planes to production. Same goes for the navy, we abandon all dockyard construction and only produce convoys. You can of course opt to handle naval production differently, I just do this for the sake of simplicity. In order to pump out more divisions, we switch our infantry divisions to the much smaller cavalry template. That allows us to use the now available surplus equipment to immediately begin recruitment of another 20 cavalry divisions. Now it's already time to plan the naval invasions. We intend to make use of fast naval invasions and therefore cover much of the British and French coastline with invasion orders. If Paradox decides to finally patch fast naval or any other exploit or strategy that I'm using, I'm going to update the strategy if possible. Look for a new video in the description below in that case, or you simply roll back to this version if you want to follow along step by step. After drawing the invasion orders, we move all divisions that we currently have to Wilhelmshaven by creating a fallback line and gather our fleets there as well. And that's all the preparation that we need. The last step is to create an intelligence agency, but that's not a necessity. We now move on to the next step, getting into a war with the UK and France fast. In order to make that possible, we are going to use what's been dubbed Yugostrat by speedrunner Survivor Michi, who discovered it about three years ago. Here's how it works. We need to improve relations with Yugoslavia, which requires 10 political power. We do this to nullify the negative relations modifier from different ideologies. It's only minus 10, so improving by 11 is enough to achieve this. We go up to 14 though, just to be on the safe side, since relations degrade over time to their base level. Now that we're having net positive relations with Yugoslavia, we need to spike world tension. The most effective way to do so is to justify a war goal on the United States, which costs us 50 political power. As soon as we start the justification, world tension rises dramatically, and since this tension originated from Germany, Yugoslavia now feels threatened by us. This modifier makes forming a faction with Yugoslavia possible, which they otherwise would not agree to. If Yugoslavia joins a faction, led by Germany, while having the anti-German military national spirit, it gets an event that has two outcomes. The nation might plummet into a civil war, or it backs out from the newly formed faction, and if it does, Germany gets a war goal on the dissenting Yugoslavia. While we wait for the event to fire, we deploy our new divisions from recruitment, and make sure that we've got the first batch of divisions for the naval invasions ready and the fleets on naval invasion support. Unless you time it for a later date, the coup d'etat event for Yugoslavia will always trigger on the 8th of February. There's a roughly 70% chance that the event ends in a war goal for us. If it doesn't, and instead a civil war breaks out in Yugoslavia, we reset instantly. Yugoslavia's sovereignty has been guaranteed by France, Czechoslovakia and Romania since game start. And because world tension is now way beyond the 25% threshold at which democratic nations, and especially Britain, can and will guarantee nations that are under threat, we only need to wait a few hours before the United Kingdom also guarantees Yugoslavia. 
As soon as Yugo is guaranteed, we pause the game, declare war and pull off the fast naval invasions by unassigning divisions after they've left port and assigning another batch of 10 until all divisions are on their way. While that's happening, let's briefly talk about the crucial game mechanic. If you've seen my Roman Empire speedrun, you already know how the major minor mechanics in Faction Wars work. For everyone else, here's a quick summary. As you probably know, wars in Hearts of Iron 4 end whenever there's no major nation left on the losing side or, if there are no major nations involved, if the enemy nation surrenders. But there is a catch that can make your conquest a whole lot easier. Whenever you are in a war with a faction, you only need to capitulate the major nations in that faction to end the war for good. All nations of that faction that have surrendered, that you hold at least a tile of, have inflicted casualties on you, or have taken damage to their buildings from you, will be up for grabs during the peace conference. And since there is no minimum threshold, you can abuse this mechanic by ticking any of the checkboxes with minor nations to basically get them for free when the war is over. I will demonstrate this by putting air wings with strategic bombing missions over the Balkans. The minimum damage inflicted by those bombers during the few weeks that the war lasts will be enough to generate a tiny amount of war score for Czechoslovakia, Romania and Yugoslavia. Since we plan on continuing after capitulating the Allies, we cancel the justification against the US and begin a new one against Albania. The main difference between the run in version 1.11 and prior versions is that France actually defends its coastline. So while it seems that the strategy from before does not work anymore, you just have to be a little lucky and overwhelm the French coast with plenty of divisions to find an opening. Capitulating Britain is a walk in the park. To break through France though, you need to pin every hostile division as soon as you spot them, while moving straight for Paris plus some additional victory points. Overall, it takes a bit longer than before the Barbarossa update, but it's still possible to pull off. But keep in mind that there is not much time to mess around. The Czechs are pushing into Germany quite quickly, and if we are not careful the war will end prematurely and not in our favor. Let me take the opportunity to quickly summarize the overall rule set for Hearts of Iron 4 on speedrun.com. Any submission has to come in the form of a full, unedited video, because it's pretty easy to cheat otherwise. The leaderboards are separated into different categories and subcategories, but let's first take a look at the general rules. All runs need to be played in the 1936 scenario, on Iron Man mode and with historical AI. Custom game rules need to be disabled and the difficulty set to regular. Messing with the save files or the console is obviously not allowed. The time for a run is determined based on what type of speedrun it is. Real-time runs are measured in actual time with the assistance of tools such as LifeSplit. Because GameSpeed 5 is only limited by hardware components, RT runs cannot go beyond Speed 4 to even the playing fields for runners with older computers. In-game time runs, on the other hand, are purely measured by, well, the in-game date. In Hearts of Iron 4, that's the date display in the top right corner. What I'm doing here is neither, because the run is segmented. Link to the full one is in the description below. So if you fancy to earn yourself first place on a leaderboard, you can try to replicate my run, record it of course, and submit it to speedrun.com. The All Majors category only has one submission for RT and none for IGT, making it rather easy to claim a record. For now, let's get back to our campaign. Our skirmish with the Allies started on the 8th of February and ends on the 19th. The peace conference shows that exploiting the major minor mechanics in faction wars does indeed work as described. Now that we've established that, we can move on to the next strategy called faction control. This one is equally powerful and as the name indicates allows us to dictate how the game plays out and to make further use of the major minor mechanics. The United Kingdom was the faction leader of the allies up until the point where they surrendered. When a faction leader surrenders, but the faction itself persists after the peace conference, the faction leadership will automatically go to the next strongest nation that's left in the faction. If we annex or puppet all available nations now, Canada will be made faction leader based on that. But that's not really ideal for us. Luckily, we can prevent that. The Balkan nations, because of the guarantee for Yugoslavia, 
not only joined the war but also the Allies. And all of them are considered stronger than Canada. So if we just leave any of them alone during the peace conference, that nation will then automatically become faction leader of the Allies. We opt for Czechoslovakia because it is easier to capitulate. Of course you can also puppet nations during the peace deal if you aim to get your hands on their fleets by annexing the puppet through the autonomy system or to leech their manpower but it will result in less captured equipment, which is the only thing that we're interested in. There won't be any major fleets left anyway when we're done with the world. After sorting out the peace deal, we used the equipment from the war to recruit additional divisions and do army innovations to get our hands on the maneuver expert. In my previous runs, I used to now release some nations to lower the impact of resistance on our manpower and equipment, but this one is going to be over so fast that no conquered nation will be able to rise up against us in time, even if we set the occupation laws to no garrison, which is exactly what we're going to do. Trying to manage occupation properly would basically bring this run to a halt, because there wouldn't be any equipment to field new units. Our next step is to assign an army to the border with Czechoslovakia and another one with garrison orders to Italy. Despite our justification against Albania, Italy offers military access, enabling us to pull in Order 66 on them. If you're totally against using Order 66, which I know some of you are, you can absolutely achieve the same results by staging multiple day one invasions into Italy, just as we've done with the UK and France. Order 66, for those of you who don't know, makes use of the unconditional honoring of guarantees, puppet protection and factions calling its members into war by placing divisions on the target nations beforehand. That way, when we declare on Albania, Italy will ignore that we have divisions on its territory, allowing us to capitulate them with little effort. Now we use the army from the Czech border to plan all upcoming naval invasions for this run in advance. This is bad practice, sort of. Ideally, if you want to draw plans in advance, use a small inactive army. Otherwise you risk accidentally deleting invasion orders or having divisions run off to orders they aren't supposed to go to. It's just a habit at this point that I have a hard time getting rid of. First we set up plans to invade Leningrad. After that we prepare invasions across the Black Sea. We want to target as many coastal tiles as possible. The overarching plan is to create front lines everywhere and force the Soviet AI into redeploy chaos. We switch over to the Bahamas next and plan our invasion of the United States. The Carolinas aren't very well guarded, so it's an ideal point of entry. Last one on the list is Japan. At the moment we don't have access to the ideal staging grounds since we aren't allied with China. But of course every problem has a solution if you just waste enough hours of your life on it. There's a way that we can already start planning now and get access to the ports later. For this we simply plan an invasion into China. The game then allows us to create invasion orders that launch from Chinese territory. Another way to make use of this is to chain up naval invasions so you can hop from port to port. In terms of what tiles to target, we are pretty much copying the strategy from my previous video in which we capitulated Japan as China in December 1936. But first, back to our upcoming war. Albania is no longer only guaranteed by Italy. Czechoslovakia, now faction leader of the Allies and therefore a victim of the infamous guarantee spam sickness, also officially protects Albania as expected. This gives us an opportunity to abuse the major minor mechanics again and grab the remaining nations in the Allies. That's why we are building airfields, ports and infrastructure in range of Canada and other former British colonies. Faction leaders, no matter how big their industry or army, are automatically considered a major nation. Since there is no other major nation in the Allies anymore, we only need to capitulate Czechoslovakia for the next war to end. Make sure to push new construction up in the queue so it's ready on time. Let's not forget about our battered little fleets and bring them back to port. We also delete all air wings to sort them again later, together with the additional planes we just captured. While we wait for the construction of our important new airfields, we split up our ships into three new fleets. We assign one of them to the Black Sea, another one takes a trip to the Bahamas, while the third fleet is moving into the South China Sea. Shortly after that, our first spy is available. 
we assign him to the region around Stalingrad and order him to build an intel network. On top of that, we begin decrypting the Soviet cipher and assign additional military factories to artillery and transport plane production. As soon as all new airfields have been constructed, we create and assign bomber wings on the air regions above Canada, Australia and New Zealand. To be able to reach them, we need to use strategic bombers for their higher operational range. Their purpose is to again create a tiny bit of war score through bombing so that we can annex them later in the peace conference. Not necessary, but since it's free real estate, why not? The rest of our air wings are deployed in Europe. Because it's a lot of clicking, I will spare you this part. All I do is group up fighters, close air support and bombers into wings with 100 planes each. The divisions that we've created with the equipment from the first war are now ready to be deployed and we still have enough equipment to begin recruitment of a full infantry army. We take half of the newly deployed divisions and create a front line towards Poland, while the other half is going to support Order 66 in Italy. To make room for the invasion of the Soviet Union, we will have to deal with Poland and are going to do so in our next war. In version 1.10 it is possible to force ally Poland and get their help against the Soviets, but that's no longer an option in 1.11. On the 29th of March, our war roll against Albania is ready. The preparations are done, so all we have to do now is to shuffle our air wings around to cover the new fronts, as well as the air zones over the minor nations in the Allies. As expected, Italy joins the war immediately after we declare on Albania, and so does Czechoslovakia and its faction members. Immediately after the war breaks out, we begin justifying a war roll on Poland and micromanage our divisions in Czechoslovakia a bit. Since the front is wide open, we just manually pass some divisions to quickly cut the country in half without capitulating them just yet. We could wait for our divisions in Italy to win on their own, but of course we want to speed up the process. First, we delete the garrison orders to prevent the AI from moving our divisions around, and then check for occupied city tiles. If some of the crucial victory points are contested, we try to maneuver additional divisions into the proximity of the fight. This allows us to pull our divisions on VPs back and in turn make room for the occupying divisions to make a mistake. And they will make a mistake. We're basically looking for two things. Either the divisions leave via port, so we can just move in, or we wait until the division is fully committed to an attack and retreat ourselves to bait the enemy units away from the victory point. In the meantime, we take care of the frontline mess in Czechoslovakia. Be mindful to not capitulate them too quickly, which can happen quite easily. The Czech divisions that were on German territory when the previous war ended got deleted at the end of the war, leaving them with just a handful of defenders. We also need to take it slow to give our bombers some time to do damage overseas, grind 5 army XP and wait for at least 7 days after Poland has joined the war. That is the minimum time a war has to technically last in Hoi 4, and if we end the main conflict before that, the war with Poland will not be merged with the main conflict and will continue after the peace conference instead. Back to Italy. As you can see, the division on Palermo has fully committed to an attack, so we retreat our defending troops, pin down the hostile division that just left Palermo and move in from a different angle. Naples has also been abandoned after we broke off the fight and is free for the taking. Combined with the victory points that we already hold, Naples and Palermo are enough to push Italy below the surrender threshold. The war won't come to an end immediately because of the aforementioned 7 day minimum time for wars and the war has lasted only 4 days so far. In preparation of the invasion of the United States, we pull all divisions from former Italy and redeploy them to Brest and wait for our war goal on Poland to finalize. The peace conference with Italy goes as expected. Sometimes Ethiopia hasn't been beaten by Italy at this point, which requires you to share with them. But you should have plenty more war score allowing you to take all of Italy while Ethiopia only takes Somalia and Eritrea. After the peace conference, we receive a fresh new load of equipment, which we immediately use to keep snowballing. But first we need to farm some more army experience, until we can create my beloved 2 with cavalry spam division template. Sending divisions from Europe to our naval invasion staging site in China takes month, and we can only deploy new units on territory that's directly connected by land to our capital. 
As a consequence, we need to create some kind of spawn point in Asia. That sounds more complicated than it actually is, we simply release Vietnam as a puppet, which is a feature from the Together for Victory DLC. Upon creation, the new puppet nation inherits the division templates of its overlord, which enables us to copy their regular cavalry and spam cavalry template back to us and begin recruitment. This only works with newly created nations. Countries that have existed prior won't inherit our templates. New units from puppet nations face the same constraints as ours, but vice versa. The game allows us to deploy them only in Vietnam, which is just what we want. With the equipment from Italy, we recruit 20 regular Vietnamese cavalry divisions, 40 Vietnamese spam divisions and 20 of our own. And now let me demonstrate another case of soft force ally by dismantling our current faction and creating a new one with China. This is only possible because we now have territory close by and created significant world tension. You can try to use them in the later war with the Soviets, but relying on AI is never a good idea in my experience. What we primarily want is the ability to not only plan, but actually launch naval invasions from their territory and make the Japanese bolster up their forces on the continent. A couple of days later, electronic mechanical engineering is finished, but we don't select any additional research just yet and instead let the 30-day buffer build up to prepare for a research swap. While trying to deploy our infantry divisions, I accidentally delete the recruitment queue for Vietnamese cavalry, wasting a few days in the process. That's pretty annoying because the timing for Japan doesn't leave much room, but after contemplating whether or not to restart, I decide to continue instead. The fresh divisions are going to protect the German-Polish border. We declare as soon as the war goal against our neighbors to the east is ready and start justifying on a Japanese puppet next. Since Czechoslovakia is considered a major and world tension is at 100%, the justification will only take 25 days. As soon as our Vietnamese divisions are ready to deploy, we do just that and send them over to Shanghai. To support our naval invasion, we of course also need to bring our fleet into the region. Since enough time has gone by, I feel confident that all conditions that we've set for ourselves have been fulfilled, so let's push Czechoslovakia below the surrender limit. The following peace conference does indeed provide all that we've planned for, so we swiftly annex everything. We don't need to make use of faction control anymore, but just so you know, leaving the Czechs alone one more time during the peace conference would not grant them faction leadership again. That's been taken away from them at the start of the peace conference. Now South Africa is the new faction leader of the Allies. First thing we do after the peace conference is to deploy our 20 spam divisions in Brest, followed by recruiting roughly 80 more of them right after. We then split our forces from Italy into two armies, sending one to the Bahamas and another one to Canada. Our spam divisions are also going to sail towards the Bahamas, most of the other troops remain in Europe. As we've discussed already, South Africa is faction leader now and therefore also a major nation. Because of that, they will join our war against the United States soon after we declare. One cavalry army should be more than enough to take care of that. While we're waiting for our divisions from Vietnam to arrive in China, the 30-day buffer for the open research slot has filled up. We're going to use it to get paratroopers a bit earlier by swapping the research in the slot that is assigned to paratroopers for a different one, and using the slot with the 30-day buffer to continue the paratrooper research. Since we have enough political and command power, we hire the maneuver expert that we've unlocked earlier for an additional 10% movement speed. Unfortunately, we have to launch the naval invasions despite our divisions not having reached full organization yet, but we still should be able to overwhelm Japan. While most of it plays out exactly as I've demonstrated in my previous video, some things about the invasion of Japan are different here. We didn't have the equipment for 50 regular cavalry divisions, for example. Those can at least hold a tile after they've taken it. We ended up making only 20 of them and filled up the rest with 40 spam divisions. The better units are going to be used in the south, around Nagasaki, Hiroshima and Osaka. The spam divs will cover the rest. I should have selected different division icons to make distinguishing the two a bit easier, 
but I only remember to do so after the war. The other difference to the previous video is that Japan will have more divisions on its home territory. We could call China into the war to make Japan redeploy more divisions to the continent, but I'm always hesitant to do so, because mm, I don't like sharing in peace conferences. The commentary is already shaping up to be longer than I expected. The script alone is nearly 8000 words long. So I'm going to keep the war against Japan brief. And honestly, there's not much to talk about anyway. After declaring war on Japan's puppets, we'd prepare a war goal on the Philippines. Our bombers that were previously targeting Australia and New Zealand are now going to create the annex conditions against Japan's puppets for us. After our naval invasion forces have landed, we quickly micromanage them towards the important victory points. It's crucial to keep an eye out for divisions leaving VPs since fighting them takes too long. If you want to optimize it a bit, put the invasion force into army sized groups after they've landed. The most difficult parts are probably Osaka and Hiroshima. If you don't succeed in baiting them away from the city tiles in time, it is going to become increasingly hard to take them over. But that's not the case in our campaign here. Since we haven't touched on that yet, let's briefly check the rule set for the All Majors category on speedrun.com. We again can play as any nation, but need to capitulate and or puppet Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States, the Soviet Union and France in order to complete the run. If we play one of these nations, capitulating it isn't necessary, of course. And that's it. Now back to the run. The peace conference triggers on the 1st of June, ending our war with Japan. We quickly annex everything so we can finally move on to the last remaining nations from when the game started. The United States and the Soviet Union. After the peace conference with Japan is over, we have some cleaning to do. I'm going to finally switch unit icons to be able to distinguish between actual cavalry divisions and spam divisions. This allows us to easily spot and select all spam divisions in Japan and delete them to get the equipment back into storage. We also delete half of what's left of the actual cavalry. The remaining 10 divisions will be used to quickly march into Vladivostok later on. Since we don't want to commit troops here to defend the region while simultaneously wanting to maximize the divisions that the Soviets commit to our new borders, we release former Manchukuo. We don't intend to call them into the war, but the Soviets are nevertheless going to guard the border. The other former Japanese puppet will remain as is to create supply hell in the region. The divisions that we've sent en route to South Africa won't make it on time. That's why we divert the majority of that army to Madagascar and prepare naval invasions along the southern tip of Africa. We will use our fleet from Asia to support the invasion. Before we move on to the United States, we quickly deploy our spam divisions and send them off to naval invasion staging grounds against the Soviet Union. We also delete the remaining cavalry divisions in Europe and assign the bombers from China over to the Philippines. Our main staging area for the invasion of the United States are the Bahamas. The American underbelly is dangerously exposed here. The US doesn't have many divisions at this point, most of them concentrated in Maine and Vermont. Soon after the invasion force has landed in the Bahamas, the war goal on the Philippines is ready. We first establish naval supremacy, launch the order, declare the war and send the divisions in batches of 10. While we wait for them to arrive, we rush into the gaps in the American lines in the north. It feels like we forgot something. Oh yeah, we aren't justifying any new war goals at the moment. Well, that needs to change, of course. It's a bit too early to go for the Soviets for my liking, so let's go for Turkey instead. They will provide much needed additional equipment, as well as another direct border with the Soviet Union that we can make use of. Just before our invasion reaches the American coast, the paratrooper research is done. We create a two-width template for them and start recruiting another full infantry army as well as 40 paratrooper divisions. Yes, 40. You can even go higher if you break the division cap by artificially inflating battalion numbers, but it's going to be a mess with this many jumps already. The first few hours and days after we make landfall in the Carolinas are crucial. Don't trust the AI to push as aggressively as we want to, even if the battle plans are set to execute aggressively. Manually managing the divisions here is a must. The payoff is smooth sailing from there on out. 
We can quickly march up the east coast and towards Texas. Just be mindful of empty pockets. The AI will mess up your push by assigning divisions to random front lines after they've split into multiple orders. Overall, the campaign against the United States is pretty uneventful. Most of the time is spent microing divisions, readjusting and deleting front lines, reassigning divisions and setting them on strategic redeployment if they are too far behind the front line. As soon as we've reached Texas, we start our push towards the west coast. After the war goal against Turkey has finished, we assign some planes to the region and declare war. Our African forces arrive in Madagascar in early July. Luckily, South Africa doesn't have divisions anywhere on its coastline anymore, because they've all been assigned to the front line in the north. Unfortunately though, I completely forgot about the invasion after launching it, and won't remember until after a month later. But this little mistake won't cost much time, if any. I will nevertheless talk about potential time saves and optimizations towards the end of the video. This run is intentionally not over-optimized, unlike the Roman Empire speedrun, to maybe encourage some of you guys to give it a shot. In the meantime, we deploy our fresh units in Europe, redeploy some light tank divisions and begin with the setup of front lines. We also station our paratroopers in airports close to the border. I usually orient my planning on the overall geography of the region. I'll go a bit more in depth about the setup after the current war is over. We finally get our second spy in late July. This coincides with our first spy having reached above 50% network strength, which is the minimum percentage to prepare and launch a collaboration government mission. The intent for the mission is to reduce the surrender threshold of the Soviet Union a little bit. The United States is about to fold, so it's time to justify our last war goal. We again opt for an indirect justification, but this time we do it primarily to avoid the Soviets' great patriotic war national spirit. Because Tanutuva isn't a puppet, the Soviet Union isn't forced to join in against us immediately, which will give us a little wiggle room to make more divisions beforehand. We're just about to march into Los Angeles, when it dawns on me that I completely forgot about South Africa. The unnecessary delay means that we have to wait before we can use the captured equipment from the Allies and from our divisions in Africa. After the United States surrendered, we can at least delete our divisions that are in North America. This allows us to begin recruitment of yet another full infantry army, plus another 12. South Africa surrenders just a couple of days later, marking the end of this war. Because we are map painters by heart, we of course annex everything during the peace conference. The Soviet Union is now the only remaining target on our list towards capitulating all major nations. Because of its size and the amount of divisions the Soviet Union starts with, we need an elaborate battle plan if we want to continue at this pace. But first we delete our divisions in South Africa and use the equipment to add even more infantry divisions to recruitment. A big part of our overall strategy was to amass as many divisions as we can before going for the Soviets by taking over other countries' stockpiles. It simply takes too long to produce enough equipment on our own for any of this to work. Another cornerstone of the strategy was to achieve a long border with the Soviets beforehand, be in a position to create pressure in the Far East and be able to take Vladivostok with little effort. Until the new units are ready to be deployed, we shuffle our air wings around and create additional ones with captured planes. I'll spare you the pathetic click marathon, in summary I try to equally spread fighters, close air support and bombers around. Nothing fancy. And of course transport planes to the airports with our paratroopers on them. Our justification against Tenutuva is ready before all of our new divisions can be deployed. But that's calculated. We declare war right away, but the Soviets won't join immediately, giving us some more time to play with. The reason that they aren't joining right away is because of the dangerous borders modifier. They share so many and long borders with us now, which they haven't fully manned, especially in Turkey and the Far East. This will make the AI hesitant to jump to its faction members' aid. I've seen the AI refuse to join the defensive war of Tenotuva from a week up to over a month in this situation. After we've deployed most of the divisions in recruitment and added 100 more spam divisions to the queue, our frontline planning looks like this. To the very north, we only have a small force stationed at the river line, 
followed by a full infantry army further south, accompanied by 10 tank and motorized divisions. This is the key vector towards the Russian heartland and has the least sucky terrain. Just south of that are the poor lads who will have to fight in the mud. The Ukrainian vector is as important as the one towards Moscow. Pushing hard here will relieve the most southern army at this border who has to push across a river and another one right after. Since our army is very infantry heavy, we appoint an infantry expert. So far I've taken the maneuver expert for additional speed, logistics expert for reduced attrition, regrouping expert for a faster recovery rate, and the aforementioned infantry expert for additional attack and defense for infantry divisions. Before we can bring our last units from recruitment to the front lines, the Soviet Union finally heeds the call and declares war on us. First order of business is getting our naval invasions on their way. By now you know the drill. Our invasions across the Black and Baltic Sea have two purposes. The primary, overarching plan is to further extend the existing front lines, allowing us to make use of our overwhelming numbers. This will force the AI to redeploy divisions away from the land border. The ensuing chaos will benefit our push in the center. The second purpose for the strategy is to be able to quickly thrust deep towards the Caucasus and beyond without first having to get past Odessa and Crimea. On top of that we are going to use our paratrooper divisions to create a large pocket in the center. The paratroopers of course cannot hold a tile against regular divisions, but they won't see much combat anyway if we quickly follow up with an aggressive push. And that's exactly what we're about to do. We force the Red Army to stretch out so much that they only have one or two divisions per tile to defend against us. As soon as the first successful drops land behind enemy lines, we begin our attack. The fact that we haven't used any of the captured trucks during our wars now pays off, since it allows us to have fully motorized supply for all armies. This phase is all about keeping an eye on frontline development, pushing into openings and pinning divisions with the goal to catch up with the paratroopers before they are overrun. Manually controlling all spam divisions in the north and south is a massive, massive pain and using front lines is super inefficient. That's why we are going to use garrison orders offensively. This approach is ideal if you face little resistance, have overwhelming numbers and want to take over large territories quickly. We are just two weeks into the war with the Soviets and have already encircled the majority of their forces in this area. The price is a little bit of our sanity while we clean up and adjust front lines and reassign divisions over and over again. And don't forget about Vladivostok of course, it's a valuable victory point and crucial to bringing the Soviets down quickly. Luckily it's barely defended. We've achieved our goal of connecting the center with the northern and southern push towards the end of September. We now need to constantly bring our forces who have fallen behind back to the front to continue moving deep into Russia at a reasonable speed. In early October our 100 additional spam divisions are ready for action. We deploy them right away and put them on garrison orders. Half will assist in the south, the other half in the north and center. Moscow falls in mid-October. We've cleaned up most of the encirclements and are now trying to push beyond the Caucasus in the south and towards the Urals in the center. Stalingrad falls in our hands soon after. When November comes around the majority of Soviet forces have been destroyed. We're not quite at the point where snaking is viable, but we're close. The last remaining victory points needed to bring the Soviets below the surrender threshold are wide open, so we keep pushing and start snaking halfway through November. It will nevertheless still take another month until it's actually done. On the 12th of December, the Soviet Union finally surrenders. And with that, we have accomplished our mission of capitulating all major nations from the start of the game. Turns out that we didn't need the collaboration government mission, but it's a nice fallback nevertheless. It would have fired towards the end of December, so still within 1936. It took nearly 12 months overall to get here, but I'm pretty certain that the strategy can be improved by at least a month or two. There's plenty of room to optimize, most prominently during the invasion of the United States and the Soviet Union. There's also potential to skip the second war altogether, and invade the US only from the Bahamas. I'm pretty happy with the results and route, but I'm not a fan of the heavy micro that's needed during some stages of the run. While it can be fun, it's not ideal for strategies aimed for actual real-time runs. This is getting quite apparent if we compare how much time it took me to get through the chapters of this route. 
Capitulating the Allies took me 15 minutes. The subsequent war against the remaining faction members of the Allies lasted 22 minutes. Rushing Japan took 13 minutes. But the United States and Soviet Union segment was nearly two hours long. Granted, I'm in no way a fast player in terms of real time, and I took a break in between. But still, the RT time for this run would be close to three hours. While grinding this route, I already thought about alternative ways that might not only be easier, but also quicker for both IGT and RT. I can happily report that it actually works and is going to be the topic of an upcoming video. I'll probably do a speedrun to form the Holy Roman Empire first, since I've promised to do that for a while now to some of our Discord members. Let me know in the comments what nation you would like to see a speedrun with. I hope that I was able to pass on some knowledge and maybe even keep you entertained for a while. This video was really fun to make but also took quite a lot of time, so I would appreciate any feedback from you guys. Thank you very much for watching, stay safe and have a great day.